Hi everyone, this is Steve and I'm here with another video. This is going to be episode 4 of my videos talking about uh, structuring bets, wagering on horse races, not so much picking winners, but talking about how to think about betting. Today we're going to talk about why you cannot beat the races, at least sometimes, and I have a little bit of a rant at the end. But before we start talking about horse races, I want to talk about roulette for a second. If you're not familiar with roulette, I assume that you are, but if you're not, uh, it's a game found in most casinos involving a wheel, a little marble spins around the track of the wheel that you see the image of there. It lands in one of 38 different numbers in the American version of the game. Uh, if you pick the correct number, then you'll get a payout of 35 to 1. Uh, that payout is always the same regardless of which number you pick. If any one of the 38 numbers on the board, you're going to get 35 to 1 back. You have 2.63% chance of winning any given spin, well, 1 out of 38. Uh, every bet you make on a roulette wheel is negative ROI. You're getting 35 to 1 back with 38 different potential spaces, so you're losing a little bit of an edge on each spin. Um, it's not hugely negative ROI, but it is a negative ROI, and because it's a negative ROI on every single bet that you can make, there is no such thing as a winning roulette player. On an unbiased wheel, which uh, all of these wheels are tested very, very often to make sure that they are unbiased, that the marble lands uh, evenly in each one of the different slots, uh, you are betting into a negative ROI situation regardless of what bet that you make. And I think most people understand that. But it does not matter how much you study the wheel, what sort of strategies you come up with, uh, you're making nothing but negative ROI bets, and therefore you cannot be a winning roulette player. It doesn't mean you shouldn't play if you don't have fun. Uh, that's fine, but you're not going to win over the long haul. Now compare that to horse racing. Uh, we don't have a fixed number of betting interests. We could have anywhere from two in a match race to 30 or more in some of the really big events you see, especially, uh, for example, the European hunt races, things like that. Here in North America, it tends to max out at about 12, 14. We do see 20 in the Kentucky Derby. But that changes from race to race. The odds are variable, not fixed. If I told you to bet the one horse today at Belmont, uh, in the eighth race, let's say, uh, I couldn't tell you what the payout is that on that is going to be right now. I haven't looked at the card. I have no idea. But even if I had looked at the card, uh, I'm not going to know until the race goes off. Uh, the, compare that to roulette, where I can tell you exactly what the payout is going to be on any roulette table in America at any casino, uh, any spin of the wheel. The payouts on horse races are based on paramutual pools. All the money is put into a pool, all the money bet by the different uh, bettors is put into a big pot. The track takes some of the money out of that pot, and all of the winners take the money out of that pool. So how much you get out of a wager depends upon how everyone else is betting into it. And uh, unlike roulette, where there's a relatively minimal rake, the edge of the uh, casino is fairly small. In horse racing, we're dealing with a takeout of about 15 to 25 percent, depending upon the pool that we're talking about. So the track is going to be taking out quite a bit of that money. So number of differences between roulette. I want you to think for a second. Imagine if roulette functioned more like horse racing. Imagine that we had a paramutual roulette wheel, where instead of there being set uh, fixed payouts for uh, every number that the ball could land on and said the payouts were based upon how people had bet into each spin of the wheel. Now, we could probably say over the long term any inefficiencies would be kind of whittled away because uh, there's not going to be any persistent money making opportunities. People are going to bet the wheel in such a way that those efficiencies are taken away. If everyone loves betting uh, certain numbers, everyone, you know, 7 or 11 or lucky numbers or people like betting the zeros, for whatever reason those just happen to be popular numbers, over the long term bettors are going to catch on. Other people are going to pour into those spaces to bet the other numbers because there's an opportunity there. There's more of a payout. Um, and those efficiencies are going to be whittled away. And eventually we're going to return to the status quo and we're going to have a, a efficient game where no one can win. But in individual spins, you can imagine a scenario where you can win at this sort of pyramidal roulette wheel. Someone comes to the casino and they put $1,000 on the seven and there's only $50 bet on the rest of the table, 
you can imagine betting two dollars on a number if you win you get all of that thousand dollars back from the thousand uh, dollar wager that was put on the seven and all of a sudden you have a huge payout that pure mutual uh, wagering as opposed to the fixed wagering is going to create opportunities for getting uh, an enhanced ROI because you're being able to bet into inefficiencies this is a little bit like how horse racing can function, at least when you're betting successfully, when you're betting into uh, good opportunities as opposed to bad opportunities. I want you to imagine for a second a horse race that functioned like a regular roulette wheel. So now we're going to go the opposite direction. Instead of imagining a roulette wheel that's bet like horse races, I want you to imagine a horse race that looks a lot like a roulette wheel. And you can imagine a five horse field in which every single one of those horses has a 20% chance of winning. Uh, there's no difference between the horses. Any one of them could win. It's the same exact chance for any one of them. And each one of those horses is bet exactly the same. So the payout's going to be the same regardless of who wins, assuming that you have the correct winner. If you were to have a race like this, you cannot possibly win. It is almost exactly the same as the uh, roulette example that we had above. It does not matter how long you stare at the racing form, how much work you put into the race, what sort of clever ideas you have. With these parameters, you cannot possibly win this race. It doesn't matter what you do. Every single wager you make into a race like this is going to be negative ROI. And the only winning move that you can play is to not bet this race because any bet you make is going to be a losing one over the long haul. This is a stylized example because you're not going to see races like this where every horse has the exact same uh, chances and uh, the exact same payout. But you are going to see a lot of races that look a little bit like this. And we can imagine now a four-horse field. And we have a favorite who has a, exactly a 50% chance of winning. Uh, the second choice has a 25% chance of winning. And then 15% and 10%. Uh, th those are uh, chosen... Uh, this isn't going to uh, match any particular race, but I think you've probably seen fields like this before where you have a solid favorite, solid second choice, and two more horses that have a bit of a chance. Once again, if this race is bet at that level where 50% of the money is put on the horse with a 50% chance and so on, you still cannot win. There is no possible edge because you see the red lines that have popped up on the bar. That's where the odds are going to be for those horses. And any one of those four horses is going to create a negative ROI situation because the race has been bet efficiently. Where the race is being bet efficiently, you are not going to have an ROI edge. And there's no possible bet that you could make. Once again, it doesn't matter how long you look at the form or what clever ideas you come up with. The way the race has been bet makes it impossible for you to have any possibility of a winning ROI wager over the long haul. Over a single race, certainly, just like you can win a single spin of the roulette wheel. But you cannot be a winner over the long term betting into races like this because there is no potential for a positive ROI. This is the example that I gave before. Instead of the chart, I'm going to give you some numbers. We have the same horses, 50, 25, 15, and 10 percent. If this were to be bet exactly efficiently, where exactly 50 percent of the money is on the 50 percent horse and so on, uh, this is what it would look like in a $10,000 uh, bet situation. I just made the numbers round for easy examples. You can imagine that we have a 15 percent takeout, which is actually a little bit on the low side for wind pools, but let's go ahead and use that. Your odds are not going to allow you, the odds that, that shake out from that after takeout is taken into effect and all that, is not going to allow you to profit on any one of those horses. The odds are going to be too low for you to have a positive ROI on any one of those horses. That's what the board is going to look like. And when you compare the odds in the far right blue column to the actual percentage chance of winning, you can see there is no positive ROI situation there. You simply cannot win this race. And the only thing that you can do as a better, uh, if you want to be successful over the long term, is to skip a race like this. You cannot win. Now let's change things up a little bit. Let's say the race is bet inefficiently. Uh, instead of exactly 50% of the money coming in on the 50% horse, we now have 40% of the money. So there's a little bit of a discrepancy between the horse's true chances of winning 
and the uh, a percentage of money that's been betted in the pool. And you can see all of the numbers throughout the list, A, B, C, and D, have been changed up. And this is a race that the bettors have gotten badly wrong and that the horse with the least chance of winning, 10%, now has 50% of the money being wagered on it. So this is with a huge discrepancy in those odds. When you uh, take into account takeout and you look at what the odds would be in the pyramidal pools, you can see, once again, uh, there's not going to be a whole lot of opportunities, even despite the huge discrepancy for making money. Three of the four horses are still not going to be positive ROI opportunities. There is, however, and this is just in the stylized example that I'm providing, one positive ROI uh, horse. This is the seahorse, and even this is a minimally negative ROI. Um, you can see how much inefficiency that you need in a pool to create positive ROI situations. Here, in this example, I have 50% of the money coming in on a horse with only a 10% chance of winning. That's a huge discrepancy between how the public sees the race and what I'm using as the actual chances of those horses winning, which, which we can't know. Um, with that, we have one horse with a positive ROI expectation, and that positive ROI is relatively minimal. Uh, this is, uh, we'll win about one every six and a half times, and you're getting seven and a half to one back on them. It's a good bet. You should make that bet because you're going to make money over the long haul. You can win. You're still not getting a lot back. Um, you need inefficient opportunity. You need inefficient pools in order to make money in horse racing. Many times the pools aren't going to be inefficient, and you simply have to skip. Your ability as a handicapper is going to be trying to figure out what those true chances of winning are for each horse in the race. We've talked in absolutes as though we can know these things. Of course we can't, uh, but the better we are as handicappers, the closer we're going to be to getting those numbers correct and precise that we can say that this horse has such and such a chance of winning, and the more correct we are about that is a reflection of how we are as handicapper. How we are as a better, by contrast, is how consistently we are only betting into positive ROI opportunities. You can be a fantastic handicapper. You can get all of those percentages pegged very close to correctly. And yet, if you're not skipping the races where you have no possibility for betting into a positive ROI pool, you are not going to be a successful better. And it just, it simply does not matter how good of a handicapper you are. Your talent as a handicapper is not going to have any. Uh, it's not it's not going to pay benefits for you because you're not betting in opportunities where you have any chance of winning. Now, we can talk about things becoming even harder. Uh, the examples I used before talk about a takeout of 15%. That's Like I said, I think that's a little bit on the low side. Usually you're going to see takeouts a little bit closer to 18, 20, 25%. The higher that takeout, the more inefficient the pool is going to have to be for you to have any possibilities of, of a positive ROI situation. Uh, you're not going to have perfect information. You're not going to know what the percentages of each chance winning are. Even if you're the world's greatest handicapper, there's going to be too much about the world, uh, the universe of that race that you're not going to know, that no one can know. What are the jockeys going to do? What sort of mistakes are there going to be? Uh, what's the physical condition of the horses? What, what sorts of things aren't you going to know? Um, you're never going to have perfect information about any race, and therefore the odds affixed to that are never going to be perfect. Breakage, uh, payouts on wagers are rounded to the nearest 20 cents or sometimes 10 cents, depending upon the wager. Uh, so if you were to get, if there were a horse that were very, very close to even money and would pay out $3.99 on a $2 bet uh, to win, let's say, on a true, you know, if, if every dime of the pool were paid out, that payout would be rounded to three eighty dollars versus a three ninety nine. dollars You're losing 19 cents out of each $2 bet. This is going to have the effect of raising your takeout once again, maybe an extra percent or two. It's going to make it that much harder for you to be able to show a positive ROI because you're not getting that additional 19 cents back for each $2 wager, which can add up on bigger wagers. And human psychology is going to make things harder for you. You're going to go through cold streaks uh, that are going to cause you to start to worry about, am I seeing the races the right way? How should we be betting them? Uh, you're going to go through winning streaks that are going to cause you to become overconfident. All of these things are going to make things make it more difficult for you to play the races, for you to be able to be betting into optimum situations. 
if you want to have a positive ROI, you need to be able to overcome all of those things. And if you're betting in a situation where you literally cannot win, it's only going to exacerbate all of the problems that we're talking about here. So what can you do then to ensure that you are betting into uh, optimal situations, that you're betting into races where you actually have an opportunity over the long haul of making money? Well, one thing that I found helps is to have fixed parameters, to know how much you're going to be betting in a situation where you have uh, something of an opinion versus a very strong opinion. Uh, rather than flying by the seat of your pants, have numbers in mind that uh, uh, $20 versus $50 versus $100 or $2 and $5 uh, what is that pegged to in terms of my confidence? How much am I going to bet where I have a very confident idea versus how much am I going to bet where I think that I only have, there's only a possibility of return here? Uh, have fixed parameters and know what those are in advance rather than trying to determine everything on the fly as you're thinking about the race. Develop plans for the races. Come up with percentages of likelihood of winning, but prepare to deviate when it comes to actually betting the race. If you go back to some of the examples we were talking about before, we were talking about the 50% and 25% and 15% and 10% horses, you can come up with a plan and know in advance as you're doing your work on a card, this is what I think about the likelihood of these horses. But you're not going to necessarily know how it's going to be bet, and so you can't know in advance which one of those horses you're going to have a really strong opinion about. You could go into a race like the one I was describing before and think that the favorite is going to be a very good bet and then you see how the race is actually bet and realize that it's going to take too much money and you realize that you have an opportunity on the third choice horse even though that horse doesn't have a great chance of winning uh, the payout is going to be favorable enough that you can actually get a positive return be prepared to deviate and think about the ways that you might need to deviate from uh, those plans Think about inefficiencies between the different pools. I've only talked about win betting so far just because it provides the easiest examples, but not every pool is going to be exactly matched up. The betting in each pool is not going to be matched up in the same way. And so just because you have a perfectly efficient win pool, let's say, doesn't mean you're going to have perfectly efficient exacta or trifecta or doubled or pick three pools. And you need to think about where you're going to find the most inefficiency uh, compared to what the opinion is that you carry into the race. Figure out where your opinion can best be expressed and where you can get the highest payout for that. Be flexible in that regard. Don't think of yourself too much as I'm a, I'm a win player, I'm an exacta player, I'm a pick five player. Learn to become more flexible and say, well, I'm a player that's going to find efficiency in where the inefficiency is and try to express my opinions that way. Know the races, do your work. Uh, uh, don't bet on things just because they happen to be on TV in front of you. Try to do your work. More importantly, though, know yourself. Know how you bet. Know what your tendencies are. Know what traps you fall into. Know how you've done previously on similar sorts of races. This is why I am uh, find tracking betting to be so important that you can go back and you can study your own performance in the same way that you would study the performances of the horses that you're betting on as you're looking at the past performances. You have all of this data available to you potentially and you should go ahead and use that. And then finally I promised you a little bit of a rant. Not, I, I'm not much of a ranting type but uh, one thing that really aggravates me is that I don't feel like players are told often enough that they're uh, regardless of any particular race, is an, is a you have no chance of winning money because the the pools are too efficient. Uh, I feel like horse players aren't told often enough that this is even a possibility that you cannot win certain races that you just simply have to skip certain races. If you watch the track feed of any track on any given day and you have the experts there, you're never going to be told that there's even a possibility that you can't win money here. That the the races are going to be bet too uh, too efficiently, you can't be bet into it. You're going to have a race that's going to look like the roulette examples that we talked about at the beginning of this video, and that's going to happen sometimes. How often it's going to happen? You can debate that because you can never know the percentages exactly, but it's going to happen that there's going to be races that you simply can't bet. Or you see YouTube videos of people that like to uh, talk about races, talk about their opinions on races, talk about how they're going to bet races, and they never tell you they're going to skip a race. They never tell you that it's worthwhile to skip a race because there's not going to be money to be bet there. Things are going to be bet too efficiently. It uh, 
too yeah too efficiently. You're not going to have the inefficiencies where you can have a positive ROI. Uh, there needs to be more honesty that these situations are going to come up, in my opinion. And I get why tracks do that. They don't want people sitting out races because people betting on races is how they make money. Uh, but I do think it's a long-term invitation uh, for error, for frustration for a lot of players who bet races where they have no chance of making money over the long haul, even if they win on a particular race. Uh, you need to learn how to skip races. You need to learn how to be selective about the opportunities and then go ahead and hammer those opinions as opposed to spreading yourself out in all sorts of races where you had no opportunity in the first place. I would like for people in the horse racing community, handicappers and wagering experts and all that, to be more forthright about that, to uh, be more willing to say this isn't the sort of race where you should be investing a lot of or any money uh, just because you have absolutely no opportunity to be making money over the long haul here. This especially applies to situations like short fields uh, where uh, it's it just hard mathematically to create the sort of inefficiency that makes betting the race worthwhile. Anyway, that is all I have for you today. A little bit of a longer video. Some of this might be a little bit basic, but I hope that the examples were worthwhile to you, maybe gave you something to think about. Uh, if you like the video, please do consider uh, subscribing to the channel where I'm going to have more videos talking about bet wagering, bet tracking. I have other videos on the bet tracking program that I've created for MS Excel. Uh, once again, thank you for watching. I hope that you enjoyed. Uh, if you uh, like this content, want more content, have questions about the horse tracking program that I have videos on and the rest of the channel, you can email me at horsebettracker at gmail.com. Otherwise, feel free to leave a comment or a question below. Uh, once again, have a fantastic day, and I hope to be back with you again soon.